Welcome to this microscopy and, and analysis webinar on an exciting field in light microscopy, live cell confocal microscopy. Hello, this is Julian Heath, the editor of Microscopy and Analysis, and I'm here as the moderator for this webinar in which Dr. Mark Brown of Andor Technology will give a presentation on how to achieve optimal live cell imaging by focusing on the principles of operation be behind the new white light and differential spinning disc techniques using Andor's confocal microscopy system, the Revolution DSD. Before we start, I would just like to give you some logistical details about this webinar. You should at this time be seeing the introductory slide on your screen. Remember that this is an interactive web seminar, and you can ask questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on the Questions tab at the top of the page that you are viewing. Mark's presentation will last about 45 minutes, and after the presentation, I will feed your questions to Mark for his answers. If we're not able to get to your questions during this live event, we'll follow up with you by email. This web seminar is also being recorded and will be available as an on-demand download from tomorrow. So now on to our webinar on optimizing live cell confocal microscopy presented by Dr. Mark Brown. So I'll hand you over to Mark who will begin the webinar. Mark, welcome. Hello, Julian. Thanks for that. Um, okay, well, uh, let's get started. So today, as Julian's already told you, we're going to look at um, optimizing the DSD for live cell confocal imaging. Um, but before I do that, before I get fully started, um, I wanted to show you this slide here that um, presents a little history, and some of it is not so much history as um, you'll see from the top line here. So um, some of you who watched the webinar last year uh, on the DSD, the, the announcement of the DSD, may well have seen this previously. Um, but you'll probably notice here that we've added two new um, elements to the Andor business. The first one on the top line is the, was the acquisition of Bitplane, um, the Swiss uh, software company who are essentially leading the way in 3D and 4D visualization and analysis. And uh, Bitplane became part of the Andor family in December 23, 2009. And since then, we've been working and getting to know our Bitplane colleagues. Uh, and I'll have a few things to say about uh, how things are going to progress in the future. Uh, and then most recently, um, yesterday, uh, and there's an announcement today in the press that we've just acquired uh, a company known as Photonic Instruments. And Photonic is a uh, designer and manufacturer of uh, two systems that are essentially involved in photo manipulation of samples. And I'll have a bit to say about that in a moment. And uh, from our perspective, the most exciting news for 2010 from within uh, the um, and or division of the company is the launch of the scientific CMOS camera, uh, which we believe is a game-changing development. Uh, and you'll see, you'll hear more about that in other webinars. I'm not going to mention that much today. Um, but the, perhaps the thing that we're going to focus on more in the later part of the webinar is on the Revolution DSD white light confocal that we introduced last year. Um, but we're going to uh, focus in on its performance optimization during this webinar. <clears throat> so just to uh, go back now to those acquisitions, I just wanted to let you know about, because I'm sure a lot of you who are either a Bitplane users or work in companies that um, utilize Bitplane or are associated with Bitplane and also Photonic Instruments will want to know uh, what our plans are for the future. So the first thing to mention from the BitPain perspective is we want to bring world leading, the world leading 3D and 4D software to Andor users. And we will progressively integrate Andor um, systems to work smoothly uh, and seamlessly with BitPain software. Uh, so you'll see progressive software integration and communication. However, what we uh, won't do is lock that system up. We believe that that software and the, and the Bitplane development should remain open to all scientists, uh, whatever systems they're using. And so we'll 
maintain an open access to the scientific community of the software. Uh, we believe that's important from many points of view, not least of all that it will stimulate us to develop the product in the right way and not get myopic about our own systems business. Um, on the acquisition of photonic instruments, I'm going to show you a little bit more about what they do. Um, but essentially, we see the uh, optical instrumentation uh, for photostimulation of specimens, whether that be FRAP, FLIP, photoactivation, uncaging, or ablation. Uh, we want to accelerate our access to that market and also the developments within our own business with, from our Frapper technology perspective. Um, the other important thing from photonic instruments perspective is that they have patents on digital uh, mirror device technology uh, and we see the digital illumination aspects of this business a very exciting direction to go into and so uh, photonic instruments represents a very exciting acquisition from that perspective. Um, but again, in the same way that we want to allow uh, access to bit plane technology by uh, users other than those who have chosen to buy Andor uh, systems, we want to maintain an open uh, access to um, support of these products, of the photonic instruments products, through third-party instrumentation users. So in other words, um, we won't lock these, this, these technologies up. We will continue to develop them, and we will provide as far as possible open access to those technologies. Um, just a couple of things. We're talking here about optimizing for live cell imaging. And um, I wanted to just say a few words about what we're doing in addition to uh, in a more general aspect of what of our development uh, process. So to give you an idea of, of our approach to to uh, bringing this to optimizing this, not only from a technology perspective but also from a, a business and support perspective. So these are essentially uh, the, our, our goals. We, we want to make best products available either through our own R and D and manufacturing or acquisition of companies like the two we've just spoken about. Um, but we can't do everything, so we recognize the importance of collaborating with uh, key companies that we're already operating with and will do in the future. We want to develop and maintain a, a knowledgeable sales force, and Andor has a, both a direct and a, a trusted distributor network. And we'll continue to build that network to try and bring the best products to market. We are in the process, uh, it's an ongoing uh, work, as you all are aware, I'm sure, to build a global service network. Um, and through our offices uh, throughout the world, we try to provide local customer-focused support teams the, and of skilled engineers who can uh, keep your systems and products running to the best of their ability. Um, we want to maintain an open supply policy, as I've already described, so that we can deliver technologies uh, into uh, environments, whether it be and or, or third parties. Um, and finally, or penultimately, we want to continue to develop new techniques and new technologies that will allow our systems and our product users to be able to get the best from their, their um, imaging applications. Uh, and then the final point to make is that um, I, I don't know whether we've made this point before uh, in a webinar, but we have a customer special request team uh, who are uh, continually working on new product developments. Um, and we want to make it clear that we are open to your ideas and your requirements as well as the products that we're supplying through our existing channel. So you have a special requirement, please let us know and, and we will try to satisfy that. Um, just on the perspective of how we work with partners for optimizing live cell imaging, um, we should say that we're very closely working with OCO Labs, who have both cage and stage-based incubators to allow temperature, CO2, oxygen, and humidity control um, to keep live cells in the best possible conditions. Uh, one of the reasons we like to work with OCO Labs is, apart from them being very nice people, 
they also have a very flexible and modular approach to building these uh, incubators. So it means that modifying them in the future works extremely well. Um, on the microscope side, uh, perhaps key things to highlight are the fact that we are working in a microscope agnostic sense, microscope agnostic sense. We work well with Nikon, Olympus, Zeiss, and Leica, so um, that most of our instruments can be fitted to all of these. And one of the key developments that's uh, benefited users for live cell and long-term time lapse recently has been the development of focus drift compensation devices. Each company has their own name for it. Um, uh, Nikon call it the perfect focus system, Olympus the ZDC, which I believe stands for Z-Drift Compensation Tool, and uh, Zeiss have something called Definite Focus. And I believe we're awaiting an announcement from Leica on what their product will be. And, of course, the other thing we're able to do with our instrumentation and, su and support of the motorization within the microscopes is to allow development of multifunctional systems that can uh, perform turf confocal and photo manipulation all within the same system. Um, clearly, the motorization and automation of microscopes is increasingly important. And for this, we've uh, worked with leading suppliers to develop uh, and bring to market piezo and high performance motion control systems. Uh, and the others you can read at your leisure. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next slide now to keep in time with uh, delivering the rest of the webinar. But um, I just want to make you know, the final point that essentially none of this can be done alone. You have to integrate with third parties, and we continue to work with our colleagues in those third parties to bring you the best in live cell imaging. <coughs> Moving on then. Let's just take a quick look at some of uh, the things or, and some of the tools that Imaris can bring to live cell imaging. Um, if you want to go and find out more about it, you'll see there are a link to the Imaris or to the Bitplane website. And this figure here on the left, um, top left, shows you the individual mo modules within um, Imaris. And these are... Um, the core Imaris at the top, there's Measurement Pro, Imaris Tracking that will allow tracking in 3D and 4D, Imaris Co-localization, Imaris Impress, Imaris Filament Tracer, Imaris XT, which allows you to extend uh, and exchange data between Imaris and MATLAB and other third-party programs, and then the most recently announced product, Imaris Cell. I'm not going to go into any detail of those, but simply tell you they're available. And then if you look up here on the right-hand side of the slide at the top, uh, we have a visualization or reconstruction of a zebrafish heart during development, and then a zoomed-in focus on the heart as it develops in, at the single cell level. The, this is a sort of classic application for Imaris, and through allowing visualization and characterization and tracking of individual cells through development, then we can get an idea of the fate and the environmental impact uh, on individual cells uh, as to how they eventually become um, differentiated as contributors to, the, to organ development and so forth. So that's a very important development or um, aspect of developmental biology at the current time. Um, in the middle uh, area on the right-hand side here, we have another visualization tool, and this one was actually developed, uh, or was uh, these examples of looking at biofilm developments. And then finally, at the bottom here, you can see all of these squiggly lines that essentially are identifying individual cell tracks um, in a study here that was, um, again, looking at uh, development uh, and tracking individual cells. So one could spend many webinars looking at Imaris, but I'm just going to highlight it really as a, a tool for um, uh, a tool for multi-dimensional image analysis, and probably the world's leading tool. Um, one way of uh, characterizing how helpful a product is uh, in terms of advancing science and scientific inquiry 
is to look at the uh, at these metrics here that our colleagues at Bitplane have um, gathered. Um, and you can see Imaris versus its main competitor, um, uh, which caught up in the 2006 through 2008 period, has now run away again as a leading product uh, by just looking at total publications in a single year and being referenced in those. And then down in the bottom here, we have uh, an analysis of looking at publications uh, percentages by visualization and um, or advanced analysis in the last 12 months. And you'll see that um, there's a pretty steady relationship between those two. And then finally, in the bottom right, we look at how Imaris um, uh, achieves or is it used in high-impact journals. So we're actually tracking impact um, versus different uh, applications here as we run for, through the last previous year or through the previous year. So that's what makes us think that Imaris is a leading product, and I'm sure those of you who've used it will, will probably agree. And uh, our team, our colleagues at, at Bitplane are continually working to improve the product and bring new features to market. Okay. So moving on now, we look at the photonic instruments um, product line and how that extends to our abilities to photo manipulate specimens. Um, Micropoint is uh, a tunable 365 through the visible galvo steered pulse uh, laser device that's capable of living of delivering a diffraction limited spot into your specimen. Uh, and with that, depending on the energy and the wavelength, uh, we can achieve ablation, so actually evaporating features or cells within a specimen, um, or we can uh, at lower energies achieve uncaging of compounds for looking at um, uh, signaling and so forth, and, uh, local environmental changes. Um, or we can, at even lower powers and choosing chosen wavelengths, we can achieve point and line um, photo bleaching and photo activation. So it's a, it's a, a powerful little device uh, with a patent around the use of a, of a nitrogen uh, combined with dye laser to achieve a, a wide range of flexibility. Uh, and this product's already supported by third parties, uh, and we'll be working with our colleagues at Photonic Instruments to integrate this into our own systems but it will continue to be supported through third parties as well. Um, Frapper is our own um, uh, photo bleaching and photo activation tool. This has unique properties such that we can use it in line with a CSU, for example, or any seaport device because it can act as a relay imager in one mode. Um, but when it's, we switch the laser into another port on this instrument, then we can use it essentially as a scanner to do photo bleaching and photo activation. Um, so we see a place, a place for both those products in the, in the product lineup. Um, the other unique uh, device here that Photonic Instruments have brought to market is so-called Mosaic. It's a patented digital mirror device, and essentially uh, you can now image that digital mirror device and switch on an arbitrary pattern of the mirrors to generate photo bleaching or photo activation simultaneously in multiple points within the specimen. So there's no need to do scanning with this device. And that gives rise to this uh, feature here we call zero delta T, which means zero delay between uh, different regions so that you can really have simultaneous bleaching or simultaneous activation without sequential access. And again, this device is supported by leading software solutions as well as within our own systems, and we will not be changing uh, access to that product, uh, certainly in the near future. So that's the technologies that we've acquired and that are coming into the business and uh, helping us to boost our capabilities. Um, let's go on now and look, again, look at in detail at the d differential spinning disk that we announced last year and we're now uh, getting ready to launch as a real product. 
and I'm going to explain why that, first of all, why there perhaps has been some delays here, but also now that our understanding of the device has developed to the point um, that we understand we've had to re-engineer certain aspects of it to really achieve the performance that's required for live cell work. So you can now, you can see here um, on the right-hand side of this picture, the instrument actually uh, in its housing with our, with our own uh, uh, CCD and EMC CCD cameras attached. Um, and I'm going to go through and show you some detailed shots of that and also look at the theory behind its operation um, and how we can tune um, it for live cell applications. So the differential spinning disk um, was patented by Tony Wilson uh, and colleagues from Oxford University, and they've set up a company to manufacture the product called Aurox. Distribution throughout the world uh, and integration of it into systems is being performed by Andor Technology and another company that you, I'm sure, have heard of, uh, but I'm not going to tell you about them, um, but you will find out more, I'm sure. DSD has concentric disk patterns, and we're going to explore their optimization for live cell work. Um, theoretically, the DSD can show confocality that exceeds point scanners. Uh, we've actually seen this performance, um, but uh, it isn't aim optimizing confocality isn't necessarily the best uh, tool or the best approach for using this product for live cell work, and I'll go into that in some detail. The DSD performance is limited by shot noise, um, and I'm going to explain that in more detail later, and we're going to explore optimizing the signal-to-noise ratio. Um, and in uh, final point, I'd say, is that uh, it's my belief and my experience to date that I believe that the DSD will be best suited to slow to medium speeds uh, up to, say, 20 hertz imaging, but that will cover a large range of applications. Okay, so um, just to focus uh, a little bit on detectors, uh, this is Andor's uh, original core competence, and uh, Andor has pushed the boundaries in this respect in many ways. Um, but just let's look at this. The Clara is the leading uh, conventional CCD product uh, that's used for microscopy uh, with 1392 by 1040 pixels at this 6.45 uh, micron pixels. It has three readout speeds and USB connectivity. And we can have fanless cooling down to minus 45, which allows the camera to be used very effectively. Um, in conditions where vibration or lack of vibration is critical, so in electrophysiology environments, for example. Uh, and by selecting the relevant readout speed, depending on your requirements, we can get down to three electrons read noise. So it's a very um, nice product. On the other hand, um, sometimes uh, EMCCD technology will have benefits um, and Although an EMCCD is generally has a higher read noise, um, it can, by using this multiplication effect prior to readout, um, achieve very high sensitivities, so that it essentially overcomes the read noise limitation. In the format we've got here, it's a million pixels at eight mic well, of eight micron size, and it does allow us to use the camera in a lot of different regimes. <coughs> So essentially, if you do a comparison between the Clara, the conventional CCD, and the Luca EMCCD, you'll see depending on the light conditions, you may choose one product uh, over another. So essentially, I call this the choose your weapon phase. Either will work, uh, and it's really down to what your primary goals are. For live cell imaging, generally one wants to achieve brief exposures, uh, shorter exposures, um, and one is willing to c perhaps uh, compromise on spatial uh, resolution in some cases. So Luca may well be the product of choice. The other thing that affects your choice, of course, is quantum efficiency uh, and sensitivity in different parts of the spectral re uh, 
region that fluorophores are widely used in. So if you look at this current slide here now, you'll see we have the spectral response curve or the quantum efficiency, if you like, of the Clara camera, uh, the CCD, which is shown there in blue and uh, magenta. And in the uh, extended red mode, we can push its sensitivity out uh, at 60% QE out to 600 nanometers. Um, but interestingly, this is where the LUCA actually starts to pick up and actually exceeds the conventional CCD in terms of quantum efficiency from about 550 nanometers all the way out to 750. And you can see there which fluorophores actually could benefit from, advanced, uh, from the enhanced capability or enhanced sensitivity of the LUCA camera. So um, we're often asked, when should I use a, an EMCCD versus a CCD camera as the detector? In essence, this graph here, uh, taken from our catalog, shows you this, that the EMCCD can track um, an ideal CCD detector, especially in regions where uh, read noise is, in, is very important, and that's down in the uh, sub-100 photons per um, pixel regime here. Uh, on, and um, there are other circumstances, of course, where, that, where, uh, where you've got lots of signal, um, where an EMCCD isn't necessarily the best choice. And I'm going to try and compare and contrast here. <clears throat> Another important factor for um, DSD is the fact that we use a white light source. And this, of course, is one of the major factors that lets us achieve a very high uh, cost, if highly high performing cost effective system. There are some features in your light source in terms of its spectral uh, uh, emission range and also its, um, uh, its brightness that are very important in terms of delivering high signal to noise ratio. Um, but one of the things we've done with that, the, this technology here, this and or metal halide light source, is to go for a long life lamp, 2,000 hours, um, but also to integrate into the system a six position filter wheel and a continuously variable shutter, well, in 1% increments. And those two, compo those two features you'll see later allow us to achieve some uh, capabilities with the DSD that other people may not be able to achieve. And this unit is fully USB uh, controllable with 340 to 700 nanometer uh, emission capability. And I just show that a bit more explicitly here in terms of an emission or uh, an, um, a, an output uh, at the specimen plane relative to a 75 watt xenon arc lamp. Uh, you can see it's very sp spiky, but by selection uh, of relevant filters we can uh, achieve uh, high performance from, from this device over the whole visible spectrum and into the near UV. Um, so that tells you a little bit about it, the other system components. Let's focus in on the DSD now. So last year um, I, I showed this uh, uh, chart that shows the um, optical configuration of the instrument. Um, it's kind of hard to get uh, a grip of in initially, so you'll see in the following slide sequence I'm going to show you in a moment, we've actually got a, developed a solid model of the device, and we'll show you where uh, the light actually goes in the physical instrument, and hopefully that'll be a bit clearer. But just referring to this slide here, the green light comes in from the metal halide light source. Um, it's reflected through the spinning disk, uh, and the spinning disk is in a conjugate image plane so that it's imaged into the uh, specimen at the objective, at the edge of the objective there. And the specimen now has this modulation that the spinning disk produces, uh, a spatial modulation of light. So it's, it's a structured illumination tool, if you like. Um, the, inf the, the light from the microscope, both in focus and out of focus, finds its way back th the, through the red lines and impinges on the disk. Now, some of the, white, the out of focus light plus the in focus light finds its way through the disk. 
and the in-focus light we refer to as the confocal signal, and the out-of-focus light we refer to as the W, the wide field uh, light. So it's the light from all of those regions in and out of focus. Now, at the disk interface, the disk is made of aluminium uh, on, a, on a silica substrate. And so the aluminium reflects the out-of-focus light as well, so that a fraction of it goes through and a fraction of it is reflected. And now into this other side, we have the wide field minus the confocal signal. Um, or the fraction of the wide field minus the confocal signal. For ease, I just refer to these as if it was a 50% uh, reflector or transmitter, which is very close to true. So those two signals, or those two images, are now imaged onto, through an image combiner, prism, uh, which reflects on two sides, and now they end up on two sides of the camera. And then we're going to show you how we process those. But just uh, I'm going to zip through the next series of slides so you can hopefully get a much better idea of how the light uh, comes into the system. So at the top left, you can see the liquid light guide coming into the system through collimation optics. It's then reflected and impinges here on the, this uh, linear feature actually shows two filter wheels. And on the left-hand side, it goes through the excitation filter and then uh, it bounces off the dichroic mirror and then finds its way through, if you look through the reflections, into the microscope. The emitted light, uh, is we draw it as two separate paths here. This is the fraction that's going to find its way when it hits the disk. Uh, this is the fraction of light that's actually going to pass through the disk and so consists of wide field plus confocal, and then finds itself to the uh, bottom prism, the prism that's close to the front of the instrument, and then is imaged through the emission filter uh, onto the left-hand side of the camera. Uh, and this now shows you the fraction of light that is going to be reflected from the disk, and it hits the disk, is reflected now, and finds its path to the other side of the prism and ends up on the right-hand side of the camera chip. And in a solid model, we've put all of that together so that you can see what the optical paths are with the instrument and how they get separated. So the separation going on at both the, the dichroics, there's two dichroics in the system, and in the emission filter path, which you can see a bit more clearly on this image. So we end up now with a reflected and a transmitted signal. These two balance in terms of the fraction of the wide field they compose of, um, but only the, re the transmitted image has the confocal signal in it. So um, let's have a look now at the disk. I'm going to focus on the disk because it's the selection and design of this disk that determine the performance of the instrument in terms of optical sectioning and also signal-to-noise ratio. And signal-to-noise ratio is critical here in terms of us getting usable signal. So um, this was the original design of the disk, that, and I've shown this last year. Um, and in this case, the unit has, a, has two parts to the disk, uh, one that was called a high sectioning part and the other a high, a high uh, background suppression part. So the, um, the disk had an 80 micron pattern, and it was uh, split, uh, in the, at least in the high sectioning area, and it had a one-to-one -one mark space ratio. So half of it was aluminum or aluminum, the other half was transmissive. In the new design, um, we've changed the disk uh, in, in the following way. We now have actually two patterns, both of which have a 50-50% transmission. We've removed that so-called high background suppression. Um, and we have a low magnification uh, area, which is a smaller pitch magnification area, which has a larger pitch. And I'm going to explain to you exactly how the pitch affects the, point, the axial response um, and how that affects signal-to-noise ratio. So if we look at, in detail at one region of the disk, um, 
then the transmitted light, the green light, the excitation light, is modulated by this disk pattern, and the uh, emitted light finds its way back to the disk, and the, a fraction of it is transmitted and a fraction reflected, as we, decide, as we described before. And there's a, uh, if, you, if you work through this equation, you'll find that by a weighted a subtraction of the two images, we end up with twice the confocal image, 2C. And if we add a, do a weighted addition of these, we can end up with the wide field. So this means, actually, it's very easy with the instrument to switch with a flick of a switch, as you can do within the software, to either achieve wide field or confocal. But before we get there, we have to do a bit of image processing. This is what the camera sees when you're imaging. It sees the wide field plus confocal on the left-hand side and the wide field minus confocal on the right. And if we take the integrated in through those two regions and we plot them versus focus or Z, Z position, then these are, these, this is actual data from these two images. You'll see we have a, uh, an increase in, com in signal around the focal plane of the specimen and then a fall back to the wide field, the out of focus light. And on the left hand side, sorry, the right hand side, we have the wide field signal with the drop off of the, uh, of the minus confocal element. So combining those, we can get our signal. So the first thing to do is to split the image around its axis of symmetry and flip around the horizontal the wide field minus confocal. And now we register these two images with subpixel precision, and we can do that now in real time, greater than 10 hertz for the whole image. Um, and once we have those images uh, uh, registered with great precision, then a weighted subtraction delivers either twice the confocal or twice the wide field. And we can deliver over those two images simultaneously if required. I'm going to delve into a little bit of theory now, because the principle only tells us that we can get a confocal signal now. We need to know how strong will that confocal signal be, what will the actual response of the instrument be. Now, based on some analysis that Tony Wilson and his colleagues uh, did in the design of this instrument, um, we have some uh, algorithms that uh, allow us to plot axial response versus, um, versus the modulation frequency or the pitch in the disk. This shows you how the response of the original disk um, performed. So this is with an 80 micron pitch. And you'll see that the response is made up of two components, the wide field plus confocal and the wide field minus. Uh, in, in practice, this, it isn't perfect, uh, as you'd expect, but this uh, performance actually turns out to be, prediction turns out to be pretty accurate. So what I've been doing uh, <clears throat> is to now take these calculations and, and uh, use them to simulate what happens with, or to calculate what happens with different pitches of the disk or different, patch, uh, different patterns on the disk. So here you can see the measurement of the full width half height maximum that's commonly used uh, to characterize the, point, the uh, axial response in the confocal instrument. And you can see uh, for a range from 40, the smallest, the thinnest response, the lowest intensity response, uh, an 80 micron pitch, which was the original uh, design, a 160 micron pitch and a 320 micron pitch. These are all being used with the 60x 1.4 oil objective. And uh, rather than show you this for uh, every possible combination of objective and uh, line spread function, sorry, um, and pitch of the instrument, um, I've chosen to characterize these uh, quite carefully, as you'll see in the next slide. Here we've, uh, I've done this for a 10x objective, a 20x, 40 uh, dry and water immersion, a 60x water immersion, and a 60x water oil. And you can see quite clearly um, that the disk pattern 
uh, is strongly impacts the sectioning, as you'd expect, um, but also the, uh, again, as you'd expect, the numerical aperture and magnification of the objective is extremely important because these modulate the contrast that we see in the disk pattern. So let's look at the 10x objective. Uh, if anyone is using 10x objective, then clearly um, we need to be using a pattern in the range of 40 microns uh, at 10x in order to get good optical sectioning. I should say, just uh, to give you some detail here, that we've got uh, that the scales on these are all the same, and they all run from minus 15 microns to plus 15 microns. And I've chosen a wavelength of 500 nanometers for these. So you'll see, as we go up in numerical aperture and magnification, we very rapidly um, achieve, uh, get to high, very strong confocal sectioning. And I put these into some graphs here. Um, this is for the low magnification objectives. I've had to put it onto a, a log scale in the vertical axis. So this is full width half height maximum for different objectives. And you can see as you go uh, from the 10 down into 20, even for dry lenses, you can achieve quite good optical sectioning depending uh, even at um, 120 micron pitch. Um, again, uh, if we go on to the next slide, then I've summarized this for higher power objectives. And you can see that we get down to extremely thin optical sections uh, for all of these objectives, from 40 right through to 100, um, at low, at these um, narrow pitches, 80 microns and so. Uh, and we may need to go to larger pitches in order to achieve more signal. So what do I mean by signal? Well, this next graph shows us that if we integrate the intensity under those curves, then uh, for different um, pitches, then these are the kinds of shapes we get. Uh, and so at low, uh, for high magnification, um, high NA lenses, um, we, we get uh, a much lower signal in comparison to lower power objectives. So I suppose what I'm saying here is the graph here on the left-hand axis represents signal, uh, but it's inversely proportional to confocal sectioning. So <clears throat> let's look at signal-to-noise ratio. So what you can see from this, from this next slide is that the confocal signal is the con contribution of the uh, optical sectioning uh, uh, or the area under the optical section curve times 2 because we're uh, subtracting these two. <clears throat> and the noise is dominated here essentially by the shot noise. And the shot noise means not the read noise of the camera, not the noise that the camera produces only in reading out the signal, but primarily by the Poisson statistics or the statistics of the fact that our confocal signal sits on top of this wide field signal. The confocal signal is always much, or almost always, much less than that wide field signal. And so it's that uh, shot noise or the noise that results from us simply sitting on a, a large amount of photons in the background that dominates the signal to noise ratio. In the next slide, um, I show you the calculations for doing this with an electron multiplying CCD. Now, an electron multiplying CCD always degrades the signal to noise ratio relative to a CCD detector, subject to it receiving the same number of photons. But what it can do is allow us to reduce the integration time by amplifying the photons that we've actually got. And in some circumstances, that can be beneficial. And if you look at the next slide, I show the relationships uh, between the conventional CCD and the electron multiplying CCD at different gains. And um, one thing to note here is that the sig these signal-to-noise ratios all depend on the preliminary assumption, which is that the fractional confocal signal that's relative to wide field that we get um, is some fraction of that wide field. And in this case, I've chosen 
point one. So essentially what we're saying here is that in order to get good confocal, um, com good signal to noise ratio from the confocal instrument, we need to choose um, the fractional confocal signal to be a relatively, you know, to be a relatively high fraction of the wide field signal. So in the next slide, I try to identify uh, two kinds of cases where, and, and to therefore choose which pitch for the uh, DSD disk that we should choose in those two cases. So there are essentially two limiting cases, and there will be many in between. So if we're working at high magnification, medium section, in other words, we, uh, then we should choose medium sectioning in order to get plenty of confocal signal. And in this case, we're generally, I'm recommending a pitch, a disk pitch of greater than 160 micron. And this will be embodied in the instruments that we deliver. So subject to the required exposure time, in order to get fast imaging, uh, we may well be able to reduce the exposure time and still achieve equivalent signal to noise ratio with an EMCCD. So this case refers to a typical specimen in the following way, a live cell specimen where we have um, either where we have specific immuno labeling or we have um, transfected signals where we have localized cell features uh, and we can achieve a good signal to noise ratio in this way. Um, the second case uh, for the cases where perhaps we're looking at whole embryos or thick tissue specimens, uh, we probably want to work at lower magnifications in those cases so that um, we can see more of the specimen and yet still achieve, and yet in order to still achieve a good signal to noise ratio and good optical sectioning, we need to have a lower pitch disc. And in this case, our pitch. Would be much would be less than 160 microns. This allows us to achieve good sectioning in thicker specimens, good signal to noise ratio, um, and yet by strong sectioning we can reject out of focus light strongly. And so, as I mentioned earlier, this probably refers to the cases where we're looking at whole embryos, or thick tissue specimens, or specimens that might be relatively highly autofluorescent. So. As in all things, there are trade-offs here. Uh, life is complicated because it depends very much on the specimen geometry and the distribution of the fluorophores within the specimen. Um, but I think we can segment the case into these two cases, or these two generalized cases, where we're either looking at localized fluorescence or we're looking at wider, uh, more gener general fluorescence in thicker specimens. So going on to the next slide here, um, uh, I'm just going to identify the, optim the um, features that, or the key parameters that we've, we've been able to achieve in the development of the instrument. So optimization of disk patterns for the balancing of signal-to-noise ratio confocality, we've just focused on that. Um, things that we haven't looked at here but that have involved an enormous amount of effort from our software development team, a real-time subpixel pixel alignment, which is now working extremely well. Uh, strong background rejection, uh, not only in software but also in terms of our optical design of the instrument. Um, and we've also, uh, our software team have developed a very nice uh, automatic calibration tool that is used daily. It's robust. Uh, and relies on a stable mechanical design, which of course has been done. Um, and we've also, through our mechanical design, allowed easy exchange of uh, filters within the instrument. I'll show you that in a moment. This is what the finished instrument looks like. Um, here now we can look in a bit more detail at it, looking at the internals. Uh, this shows the instrument on a side port. What happens for the upright instrument? Uh, well, we don't have a final solution yet, um, but as you can see here, there is a solid model here showing the way that we will couple 
the camera and DSD together, and these, this is a lightweight solution. It will be possible to mount this onto an upright microscope. Uh, this shows you the components of the DSD uh, and the fact that you need to change, in order to make the unit work at different wavelengths, you need to change these filter turrets and also a slider in the camera path. Um, we're able to do that without removing the instrument from the microscope, as you can see here. We, find, we feel that's a very important benefit that our instrument brings to the uh, product. So it sits on the side port, and you can access these filters directly manually without having to remove it from the microscope. Um, and the automatic recalibration procedure, which takes about two minutes, means that you can be up and running again in less than five minutes between changes. Here are some other key features that we're able to deliver. Uh, we've worked hard on background rejection, and the pre-filtering in the light source allows us to have a very low background in the instrument, and the auto calibration further allows us to achieve that. We've got support for CCD and EMCCD detectors, uh, which, may bring a, which will bring us benefits for short exposure experiments, which we feel are going to be important for live cell work. Um, the fact that we've got a light source with external uh, filters means that we can, gen we can have more than three wavelengths in, an, in a single experiment with our instrument um, because by combining multiband exciters uh, and emission filters with up to six excitation wavelengths, um, we can work with uh, more colors in the specimen. Um, the, this also allows the use of ratio biomarkers, of which there are a number of being, have been developed uh, for all kinds of, uh, of, uh, feet of biochemical uh, actions within the cell, signaling actions through calcium and so on, pH and so forth. Um, and it also allows us to support fast external switching and shuttering, for example, with a, a, a DG4 from Sutter. And, of course, that allows us to minimize phototoxicity. Um, so now I'm going to go on to show you some of the images that we've acquired in the last few months with the instruments. Um, and these are still not optimized for speed and signal-to-noise ratio, but the new designs of DISC will be reaching us this week or early next, and so we'll be bringing those to the market uh, in the June time frame. This shows you optical sectioning through um, nuclei in rat liver sections. And you can see here, this is a Z-series just unrolled in a film strip, uh, showing very, very strong optical sectioning. When we look at the instrument <coughs> in an, uh, an uh, orth orthogonal view mode in the software, you can see the, uh, that we're able to look through the specimen. And we have these nuclei look relatively look reasonably uh, well uh, in terms of their shape. They look regular, and they appear to be imaged very well. And if you look at the inset of the graphic here, you can see what extremely low background we have in the regions um, away from the cell where there's actually not much going on. And then we go on to look here now at using the instrument for three color imaging to show that its performance for in the red, green, and blue uh, is all uh, good, and this shows you some uh, a relatively thin uh, cell specimen. Uh, this is actually a, um, a slide from molecular devices, and you can see the strong optical sectioning and rejection in out focus light there. We do this also in sections. I think this is an especially telling result here. We can do this not only at high magnifications, we can also do it at 20x with a dry lens. And again, this shows you the strong ability to reject out of focus light. You can do it in thick sections here. This is a 30 micron section uh, in comparison to the wide field. And you can see an enormous amount of detail in the cell nuclei here that are completely lost in the wide field image. We can do this in thick specimens. Uh, this is a spore from a potential customer. Um, this, with wide field and uh, other spinning disc techniques, we simply see a, a mush. We're not able to reject out of focus light. We get too much crosstalk. But with the DSD, we were able to get uh, optical sectioning even in the presence of this very high 
background fluorescence. So in conclusion, these are the, uh, the essentially head-to-head -head comparisons between our other revolution spinning disk, the laser spinning disk and the DSD. And you can see it's all about horses for courses. Uh, I'll come back to that <coughs> slide if anyone's interested. And that's the end of the presentation. Thanks for your, for your uh, attention and questions are welcome. And uh, thanks to all of these people here who without their efforts and ingenuity, uh, we wouldn't be presenting this webinar. Thank you. Okay, hello, this is Julian Heath again. Thanks a lot, Mark, for a great presentation. We have just a few minutes left, so we better move on to the question and answer session right away. So the first one uh, in, in the list is, how straining is the system to the specimen? The, the questioner asks, I guess you need basically twice the excitation light hitting the specimen for the same amount of signal? Uh, compared to what? <clears throat> Okay. Uh, when you say twice as much light, mm -hmm. um, well, mm -hmm. the, I think I think in all I cases, think he's implying because it's a 50% transmission. Okay, well, it's 50% mm -hmm. transmission, but remember, then we when we combine mm -hmm. the signals, we are now effectively mm -hmm. um, we get we get the benefit of of twice confocal over the wide field. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a very difficult question to answer. I think, I think we would need to dig into mm -hmm. what we're comparing it to. Um, but in order to get the same amount of wide field light, then, then well, actually, no, no, I think the wide field is going to be equivalent to the same amount of, uh, yeah. to the signal you would be applying in a wide field context. Okay, the next question, can you vary the speed of the disk? No. Uh, the disk is fixed. At, well, actually, it's, I mean, it could be done, but we don't see any point of it. The disk mm -hmm. runs at 10,000, uh, sorry, at 6,000 RPM, and uh, this means that one revolution takes 10 milliseconds. In our experience, 10 milliseconds is the minimum exposure you're going to get any kind of usable amount of light from. So, uh, and increments of 10 milliseconds allow you to go uh, still relatively quickly, so we, d we don't see any point in doing it. We are synchronized to the disk if we run our exposures at 10 milliseconds. But it's far less critical, I think, once you get beyond one revolution than it would be, um, say, with the CSU, where you are actually achieving one scan in 30 degrees. So it's a different kind of animal, I, I would say. Okay. Now the next question, can you just summarize which applications um, the spinning disk, disk can compete with a standard confocal system? Uh, is there I any specific application that is best suited, say, to the spinning disk? Yeah, I think as I try to point out here, I think for live cells, um, as long as you, you uh, I think for live cells it's going to be extremely good, and I think for whole embryos it's going to be extremely good for embryos because we can work at low power and still achieve good confocality. Um, so we can reject all of that out of focus light. That's a problem with other methods. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the live cells, I think because we can tune the optical sectioning, uh, we can get plenty of signal in a relatively short time. So I think compared to point scanners, it, it, will, it will win in both those in terms of speed and confocality. Oh, sorry, in terms of speed primarily, mm -hmm. but for the laser uh, spinning disc, like the Yokogawa spinning disc, it will do much better for the thicker specimens and low magnification. It will never compete on pure speed, um, so I would see it sitting somewhere in the middle between those two and actually having benefits above both um, in terms of uh, 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 different ends of, of, its, of its operating regime. Okay. Uh, there are two questions. Maybe you could answer these together. First of all, how do you change between low and high magnification modes? Is there a motorized option? And secondly, when do you expect to have a solution for upright microscopes? Um, switching between them is the click of a, <coughs> a button in the, in the software interface, and it's motorized. You just slide the disk mm -hmm. slides left or right, and then you're looking at one pattern or the other. The upright microscope solution we expect um, to be shipping uh, 
in probably, we expect it to be completed in the July, August time frame and to be shipping in September time. Okay, the next question regarding the acquisitions. Well, what microscopes do the Photonics Instruments products fit on currently? Uh, just about everything. Just about every everything, microscope yeah. on the market. Mm -hmm. Any infinity corrected microscope, pretty much. In fact, I don't even know if it needs to be infinity corrected, but I think you, that would be the best bet. Okay, here's one that you may choose to answer or not. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the questioner says, I, he, I recently had a hands-on demo with the Zeiss v Viva Tome. Is there any real difference with your system? Uh, I think um, Zeiss have done a very nice job. But let me just bring you back to this slide here. Well, number one, from a convenience perspective, uh, we believe we have a better solution. So we can change the filters without removing the instrument or the camera. Um, and the second point, or the, se or the other series of points, is we believe we have lower background uh, because we have a pre-filtered light source. Um, so we inevitably, uh, we believe we've achieved that. Our measurements indicate it. Uh, we don't believe Zeiss are doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the option to include EMCCD cameras. I don't believe Zeiss are supporting those. The use of external filters um, allows us to achieve more than three wavelengths or to work with ratio markers. So we believe that that is a significant advantage. And finally, our disk is running at uh, twice the speed of Zeiss's, um, which means a 10 millisecond minimum exposure time. Mm. And one final question. Will it be possible to have multi-dimensional real-time reconstructions with IMARIS of the data being acquired on the Andor system? That's a very good question. Uh, actually, the two things w that we have on our roadmap to integrate between IMARIS and, I and, and IQ are as follows. Number one, is to allow Imaris to read the image disk directly, and that should be available in July. And number two, uh, the real-time rendering you talk about is actually an extension of the ability for Imaris to peek in at the images as they're being acquired, and we have that on the roadmap for December this year. Okay, well, thanks again, Mark, for an excellent presentation. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so we'll have to conclude this webinar now. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. As a reminder, today's event has been recorded, and so you'll be able to view or download it from tomorrow. You'll also be able to download a copy of the slides, and there will be a feedback area should you have any further questions or comments you wish to make to Mark. An email will be sent to you with all this information, and the microscopy and analysis team are planning more web seminars, and we look forward to bringing you details of these in due course. So thanks again for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. That does conclude our conference for today. Thanks for participating. You may all disconnect. <laughs>